This video is for chapter nine um, of your textbook, and that chapter is entitled Change. In this chapter, um, it is a little bit more socio-historical um, than previous chapters. Uh, so there is less focus on um, terminology and typologies um, and theories uh, than the focus is more so on how uh, the concepts of like love and marriage and um, sexual intimacy um, are socially constructed. And because they're socially constructed, uh, that means the meaning and the values that we attach to those institutions, um, it, they, they've changed over time. And really the focus of this chapter is kind of discussing those changes, um, which is why it's entitled Change. So it begins with um, a discussion of diamond rings. It kind of sets the stage um, of a proposal um, that is occurring, but instead of the woman being presented with a diamond, she is presented with a thimble. And then your textbook shares the story that, you know, it used to be that a thimble was the kind of um, uh, typical normative token um, that one would give someone uh, if you were proposing to them, um, that rings didn't become a standard sign of betrothal um, until the late uh, 1800s, and then diamond rings didn't become the standard um, until the 1930s. And of course, that was related really to um, diamond uh, jewelry companies um, and just uh, kind of a, a marketing campaign. And so now, of course, you know, we, we think about diamond rings, um, especially rings that, uh, you know, worn on our left hand, on our ring finger, right? You know, we associate that with being a very well-known symbol um, you know, of, of, of being engaged. Um, now, of course, you know, the symbolism of diamonds have further changed because it, what, um, what diamond uh, ring, uh, you know, companies, jewelers like De Beers, what they discovered is, is, you know, by really just marketing diamond rings to um, you know, women who are getting engaged, you know, that they were really limiting their consumer base. So I don't know how many of you maybe remember what was called the right hand campaign, but the right hand campaign was specifically geared towards successful women, um, women who perhaps might never marry, who are, or who are becoming, you know, part of that growing demographic of never married, but uh, you know, financially secure on their own. Um, and so it was the idea that you could buy yourself your own um, diamond ring. And you can kind of see that if you look at the ad copy um, from those De Beers campaigns, you know, that they're playing on that idea of independence. So I have a couple um, that, you know, for you uh, to check out. Um, and uh, I'll just read one of them out loud. Um, your left hand sees red and thinks roses. Your right hand see, sees red and thinks wine. Your left hand believes in shining armor. Your right hand thinks knights are for fairy tales. Your left hand says, I love you. Your right hand says, I love me too. Women of the world, raise your right hand. And, and that was kind of the, the tagline, the consistent tagline at the end of all of these ad copies was women of the world, raise your right hand, right? So they were trying to kind of shift that symbolism um, around diamond rings and, 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 and just once again playing with this, the idea that these types of tokens, that these types of rituals, these types of norms are socially constructed. And so therefore the check, the meaning of them, the, you know, values associated with them, what they symbolize, you know, that of course means it's changeable and in flux as well. So before we start talking about these different changes, we're going to talk about changes related to sexual intimacy, um, changes related to courtship um, and dating, and then changes related to marriage. Um, before we get started, you know, let's uh, introduce the concept of, of marriage. Um, marriage is a legally recognized union between two people um, in which they are united sexually, cooperate economically, and may give birth to adopt or rear children. It is the socially approved mating relationship 
Um, and it's one that people expect to be uh, stable and enduring. Um, even with divorce, prenuptial agreements, um, you know, the kind of uh, increasing um, popularity around open marriage or um, ethical non-monogamy, um, it's worth noting that research does suggest that when you talk to people, they still have this expectation, or people, um, you know, most people in America, they still have this expectation, you know, that their marriage is going to be stable, it is going to be enduring, um, you know, it's right there in the vows till death do us apart. Even though, of course, um, for 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 many people now, um, you know, they part long before death, um, and and once again, just showing that as we we cling to maybe this kind of traditional idea or notion of marriage, we cling to that traditional notion even in the face of clear changes um, to how the institution is playing out in the day to day lives of real people. Now. What marriage used to be, um, your book t introduces two concepts. Um, first of all, they introduce the concept of the patriarch or property marriage. Um, and so this is the type of marriage that occurred under patriarchy, not the modified patriarchy that we have today, where, you know, you know, technically we do have legal equality. Um, you know, I'm talking about the old school patriarchy where men really were the head of their households, as well as in all leadership positions, head of all leadership positions in, you know, the, the workforce in in, in politics, um, in society in general. And women were seen as dependents like children or like property, which is why this is also referred to as property marriage. And then um, that was kind of the, the normative model of marriage for a long period of time until, you know, it started to change a little bit in the 1920s. And then it kind of, full, those changes were fully ushered in with the concept of traditional marriage, which you can associate with, you know, the 1940s, 1950s. And we will talk about both of these concepts in more detail as we go over our history. So we begin with um, the Puritans. So just some qualities that you should just know about society during this time period. It's an agrarian society, meaning most people are farmers, but they have established, you know, um, stable and enduring townships um, in small cities, meaning they're no longer migratory. Um, it is a patriarchal system, and that system is enforced uh, by church and community. Um, you know, even though, you know, that separation of church and state was not very separate back then, uh, you know, and in these, these families where men were the head of the household, um, you know, oftentimes these were really large families, um, but part of the reason why the, um, the, the number of children were so high is because there was also the risk of high infant mortality rate. And it's also worth noting that there is, you know, also at this time period, um, fairly high uh, maternal mortality rates as well. Um, and so even men, it was not uncommon for men to have multiple wives across their lifetime, not because they were getting a divorce, but because oftentimes women would bear children until their bodies, their health, uh, their lives would give out. And then, of course, men would have to immediately, um, you know, find a, a new replacement um, not just because they love being married so much, but because of the real logical need and real practical need of needing a, a mother um, for this kind of, you know, large brood of children that had been left behind. So, you know, what were the themes surrounding love, marriage, and, and sex during this time period? Um, so, you know, this is the time period where the patriarch property marriage um, is, is dominant. And people, you know, got married, uh, not usually, uh, you know, or solely on the basis of love, but really, you know, in regards to practical concerns, like we need to merge our land together, this family and that family, or, you know, this person, um, you know, comes from a, a really uh, financially stable background, and we need uh, that type of financial security, we need to marry our daughter into that type of financial 
financial security. And that practice of like giving your daughter's hand away, you know, giving away your daughter, you know, that is because at this time period, you know, uh, women were seen as property. You went from being the property of your father to the property of your husband. And your book discusses this when, you know, they talked about when things like sexual assault or, or rape happen, you know, it wasn't so much that it was seen as a violent crime against the woman herself, so much as it was seen as a property crime against either her husband or especially, you know, if you're talking about a young woman that's pres presumed to still be a virgin before the assault took place, you know, it was a it was a crime against her father and against, you know, her financial worth, his ability to, you know, marry her to the right type of mate. Um, and so, you know, people weren't getting married, um, you know, because of this idea of love. It really was um, largely these kind of practical concerns. Doesn't necessarily mean that people didn't experience love. It doesn't mean that they maybe did not even go on to love, you know, their, their spouse, because there are certainly written communications that would suggest otherwise. But just that love was not the... Um, sole or most important or socially acceptable reason why why people would marry. In regards to sex, um, largely, you know, in the Puritan society, all non-marital and non-reproductive sex was forbidden. So this didn't just influence, you know, the fact that therefore sex that was premarital or extramarital was forbidden, but it also meant that sex, certain sexual acts, if it wasn't the type of sexual acts that was going to result in, uh, you know, reproduction in, in the possibility of fertilization, then those acts were, um, you know, forbidden. And of course, you know, obviously that means that same sex um, you know, attraction um, in, and, and uh, sexual activities were forbidden. And so, you know, the slogan that your, your book provides you is, you know, the idea that sex is for babies. And so with that kind of, you know, rather rigid, uh, you know, um, uh, approach to sex and intimacy, you know, obviously there was a lot of concern about uh, people upholding the, the, the values and, and the morals of the society. Um, and women especially were seen as being especially vulnerable to sexual sin um, and female sexual freedom was curtailed. And of course, you know, um, they maybe justified it with this whole, you know, women much like Eve are more susceptible, you know, to uh, lust. Um, but really a lot of it was due to concerns related to, um, to reproduction and, and property. Um, you know, this is before Maury and the ability to, you know, take a test and prove, you know, that the child is or isn't yours, you know, as the saying goes, mama's baby and daddy's maybe. So in a society where, you know, private property and passing on property to your heirs, um, you know, to your descendants was really key and, you know, and there's no way to effectively, uh, you know, test at that time if a child was yours, how they got around that or how they tried to get around that was, of course, by making it um, especially uh, difficult and, um, you know, socially unacceptable and stigmatizing um, for women to engage in uh, you know, particularly extramarital sex, um, you know, that could really result in uh, ostracism, um, if not social expulsion. So, you know, think about, um, I don't know how many of you had to read Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, right, you know, but that was part of the concern, or, you know, that, that is an example of a puritanical society, um, and the fact that she was, you know, had to walk around with that scarlet A, right, because in these societies, the fear that men were raising, you know, babies that weren't theirs, leaving their property to children who might not be theirs. I mean, that fear was real. And, and this was the way that they addressed that. But that's, but 
despite that being the case. Um, due to population concerns, sexual deviation was rarely punished by the most extreme measures on the book, particularly if the sexual deviation, you know, was related to like premarital sex. Um, you know, there weren't enough people, particularly in these societies, there oftentimes weren't enough women, you know, for you to, uh, imprison or expel or, you know, in, you know, uh, uh, put to death, you know, a woman um, who has engaged in um, one of these uh, so-called sexual sins. Um, and then, of course, we also know that particularly in regards to the men, you know, they broke their sexual code and in, in, uh, as well, um, and oftentimes without punishment, uh, particularly in regards to the sexual violence that was perpetuated on women of other races. Your textbook mentions African and Native American women in particular. So the comparative uh, North American society during this time period um, is are the Native Americans. Um, and so although we don't know the exact number of Native Americans uh, who were in the area we now, we now considered to be the United States, um, before European arrival, you know, there are anthropological estimates uh, that put it up to 18 million um, at that time. And of course, although we think about this as being like a unified group, um, you know, they were enormously diverse, right? You know, they did not consider themselves to be one people or, you know, one tribe. Um, so, uh, you know, they were diverse in terms of how their societies were organized, they were diverse in terms of their belief systems, they were diverse in terms of their languages. Um, but there are just kind of some larger themes that that come out of, uh, you know, anthropological research on these early Native American tribes. For one thing, um, almost all of them were hunter-gatherer societies, what your book refers to as forager societies. So unlike the agrarian societies of the Puritans, which were relatively stable and stayed in one spot, of course, these um, societies, they did a lot of moving um, as they were kind of uh, following food. Um, and the fact that they were not staying in one spot um, was, is, was one of the things that probably contributes to um, some real distinctions that we see between these societies and the Puritan society. So admittedly, um, you know, their sexual lives seemed particularly scandalous to the Europeans at the time. Um, for one thing, there was acceptance of sexual, um, you know, sexual relations outside of committed relationships. Um, you know, depending on the society, there was oftentimes a practice of both monogamy as well as polygamy. Gender nonconformity was accepted, as were same-sex relationships. Um, and a lot of this kind of sexual kind of freedom and tolerance, uh, as well as the fact that for a lot of tribes, they were matrilineal, 25% of the tribes were matrilineal, and even the ones that weren't matrilineal, very few of them had the kind of rigid patriarchal structures that you saw in, in Puritan societies. And, you know, a lot of that is probably related to the fact that, you know, being a forager society, they didn't really view property as something that could be owned. And because it could not be owned, you know, they did not necessarily have to worry about passing it along to their, you know, direct descendants or their heirs. Um, and so this led to them having a very different view of children um, in the sense that, you know, regardless of who the father was, children were seen as belonging to the, the tribe, um, or if, if not or the, the kinship group, if not the tribe. Um, and of course, if this is your view of children, then it maybe makes sense why they were able to have kind of more tolerant and um, looser, uh, if you will, sexual regulation. You know, going back to uh, a lot of what is at heart in the Puritan society, you know, beyond, you know, their kind of uh, religious uh, beliefs is, of course, that concern around reproduction and that concern around inheritance. 
if you take away that concern around inheritance, then you don't have to regulate sexuality nearly as closely, particularly female sexuality, um, if you aren't focusing on whether or not it's a child is, is, is your biological child and therefore is worthy to, you know, inherit your land. If you don't believe that land is something that can be owned and inherited, this literally kind of frees you up from that mindset. Um, but that was not the mindset, obviously, of, of the Europeans that had settled in America in that time. And that, that even though Purit Puritan societies, you know, um, although they kind of evolved and, and they modernized, um, that model of, of the patriarchal property marriage, that model of, you know, sexual repressiveness and especially, you know, women, um, you know, kind of being um, unable or, or more restricted in the sexual realm, you know, that model kind of persisted in America beyond the Puritan communities for, um, you know, a, a couple of centuries until we reached the um, turn of the century when the Industrial Revolution occurred. So, you know, the key thing about the Industrial Revolution, what really just resulted in a lot of changes, is the fact that it meant that instead of being an agrarian society, societies were now becoming more industrial. So instead of people, you know, working from home on their family farm, they are now going, you know, to work um, largely in factories um, and they're getting paid for that work. So there is paid labor or wage labor. So now you are making money. I mean, you're spending your day like making this product that, you, you know, doesn't belong to you. You know, it belongs to whoever owns your factory and they're just paying you for your time. And so this also means that instead of producing now a lot of your own goods the way that it was on family farms, right, where people were raising their own food, maybe raising their own, you know, livestock and therefore making their own clothes. Um, you know, now, of course, uh, you know, you're not doing that. So you have to buy those things. And so what we also have at the same time as work becoming separate from home is we have what your book calls the commodification of society. You're working for money and you now use that money to, to pay for things. Um, things that maybe 100, 200 years ago you would have made yourself on your family farm. Now, why was this significant for family life? That's because that, you know, um, for the first time in large numbers, we have a division of labor based largely on gender. Um, on the family farm, you know, it's a patriarchal society. So the men are the head of the household, but both men and working are working in that household. And in some cases, you know, it wasn't even like an inside outside divide, right? It's like you both are working in the family fields. You're both working to, you know, raise and take care of the livestock. Um, so even though it is patriarchal, at least in terms of work, um, you know, the work itself was maybe, you know, more egalitarian in the sense that you are both, you know, your home is your livelihood and you're both contributing in, in similar ways. But now that you have this wage labor, now that you have people going outside of the home to work, what happens for a lot of families, particularly married uh, families is that the husband goes, uh, you know, out to work and and makes wages for his labor, and the woman stays at home. And now the the home is no longer seen as the source of the livelihood; it's just seen as the personal home. Um, and so, you know, if you want to start thinking about, and and we'll talk about this more later in this lecture, but if you want to start thinking about, like, when did women's labor maybe start to become devalued? It's during this time period, right? because now the home is no longer revenue generating. Um, and so it's not that she's working less, but this work now has less value in a society based around wage labor and commodification. The impact on children, um, you don't need as many children um, if you don't have the family farm. You know, in an agrarian society where most people were farmers, people needed children, particularly boys, because that was like your work crew. Um, they helped work the land. But now 
if you no longer have a farm and, and you're going off to work, although, you know, labor laws and, and, and school, you know, laws mandating, uh, you know, education haven't been passed yet, children no longer have the same economic value. Um, and so what you start to see is, of course, shrinking families and there's no longer this kind of reproduction imperative. So what's going to happen to our motto that sex is for babies? Well, what you now need is a new logic um, to guide sexual activity. If sex is no longer for babies, then what is it for? And so your textbook talks about, you know, during this time period, we, you can see in the, the media, um, you know, of that time, the books and, and the, the music and, 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 and the arts that come out during this time, you can start to see this new logic um, being pushed what's called the gendered love sex binary where you have this association um you know of women with love you know that women are looking for love that they're looking for romance that good women are not interested into sex that they don't have these kind of carnal pleasures and desires um and that men are more lustful so you know as opposed to what we saw in puritan societies where of course it was women we were concerned about in regards to sexual sins now with the gender love sex binary literally women are just um are kind of divorced from the idea of of having kind of sexual you know of having a sexual nature and sex becomes masculinized it becomes associated with men and so this is that beginning of the sexual double standard right that you know what was acceptable for men sex sexually um, is not acceptable for women and so what we start to see because sex is no longer just about reproduction and we start to see these messages that men have sexual urges that go beyond marriage that they can't control we see this like rise in prostitution now admittedly there had been prostitutes before but what we really see during this time period and, and of course this was probably aided by the fact that we also have the growth of of cities happening as well urbanization but what we see of course is this is this great increase in prostitution and we have what your book calls you know this good girl bad girl dichotomy um which we've talked about in this class already in regards of the madonna whore um uh dichotomy um, but this idea that good women aren't interested in sex, that men shouldn't expect good women to be interested in sex, that they should not expect to get all of their sexual needs or urges met by the good women, i.e. the wives in their lives, but that bad women are interested in sex. And while you can't marry this type of woman, you definitely can have sex with this type of woman. And it was, sexual, and it was socially acceptable because of the sexual double standard. Now, of course, these women did not have high standing and they were not you know, granted respectability um, in, in larger society um, because, of course, they were, you know, um, not conforming to that sexual double standard. They were on the wrong side of the Madonna whore, good girl, bad girl dichotomy. Um, but what this really um, is, is what's really kind of uh, important about this time period is that especially for men, um, a lot of that, those like sexual, you know, repressive, um, you know, strict dictates that came out of the Puritan era, they are being lifted for men. It's worth noting that, you know, unless you're a prostitute, they're not being lifted for women. Um, but, you know, we continue to move forward. We continue to progress and as you know our factories get bigger and the cities grow around them this continues to change what sex and marriage and and love what it looks like in society so as we go into the 1900s this time period is marked by industrialization it's marked by urbanization i've already mentioned the growth of cities and it's marked by the commercialization of leisure because that's the other thing as people move into these cities and they are are, are no longer on, on the family farm and, you know, they go to work, but they don't spend all day working because that also is distinct from farm life where you might would work from sunup to sundown. Now with wage labor, um, even though the laws that have like a maximum work day work or work week haven't been put in place yet, nevertheless, you don't work the entire day. So now you get off and you have this money and it's like, and you're in the city. So what are you going to do? So your book talks about how all of these kind of amusements, um, 
evolve, right? You know, everything from clubs, uh, you know, to bars, to, you know, parks, to, uh, you know, uh, fairs. Um, so, and, and, and of course these things cost money. Um, and, and what goes along with this is that, you know, as you now have these fun things to do and you have money to, to do them, then the question becomes, who are you going to do them with? And so it is during this time period in the cities that the, the former courtship method of calling is replaced by this new courtship method, which is called dating. So I'm going to come back to this slide, but I'm going to talk about the distinction between the dating system and the courting ship system. So the courtship system was the predominant, um, you know, uh, kind of premarital uh, kind of uh, uh, process by which you uh, interact with, with potential uh, marriage partners um, during the 19th century. And sometimes this system is also called calling. And that's because, you know, what it involved would be that you would call upon, if you were the man, you would call upon the woman that you're interested in in her home. And this, this, this meant that, you know, you had to have her family's permission and kind of larger kind of, you know, family, you know, approval. Usually both families had to approve and you would be you would call upon her in in her home under the watchful or you know uh the the near watchful near eye of of family members um and so you know that's what calling looked like but with the rise of the cities and wage labor what we get at in the start of the 20th century um, is the dating system and this is also sometimes called the treating the treating system so in the dating system now of course you know you are um, you, you're going out right you are are picking up your date and then you are going somewhere so let's just kind of compare some some uh, particular points between these two so so one major difference between dating and courtship is that dating at this time in particular involved multiple overlapping relationships without the expectation of long-term commitment. So you could date multiple people at a time um, that it was not neat, seen as being uh, nearly as serious and the expectation of commitment or monogamy wasn't there the way that it was um, with calling. Another kind of significant difference is, you know, under the courtship system, like I said, it was more of a public decision because, you know, it usually involved her parents, his parents, uh, I don't know, all the all the church goers, and church folk and town folk, um, you know, would be weighing in. Um, but, you know, it, it was it was less private. Um, even though it took place in a private setting. It took place in a home. Um, dating um, was a more private matter between two individuals, right? Usually it just involved you deciding to ask someone to, to go out. Um, and this private um, decision, however, uh, you know, this private interaction, it took place in a public setting, you know, a restaurant, a movie, or, or theater. And unlike courtship, dating involves spending money and 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 participating in that consumer, you know, um, commodified uh, uh, society and culture. And this is where the term treating comes from, because oftentimes, uh, you know, this was a gendered act. Men treated their female dates. And, and, and the reason why it was established this way is because at this time period, first of all, um, young men were much more likely to be working for a wage than young women were. And even of the young women who were working, because there have always been working class, working poor women who have been part of the labor force. Um, you know, if you think there's a gender gap today, well, there was a real gender gap back then. So, you know, it, it was the sense that, you know, it was his treat, um, largely because he could afford it um, and she could not. And so that's kind of the other kind of significant difference between the calling and the treating system. Um, and your textbook does note this, that this was a shift in power. Women had more power under the calling system. They, you know, had, they, they had some ability to, 
uh, welcome or not welcome someone into their home and into their personal space um, because no money was 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 being spent. You know, they had a lot more control over, you know, to what extent they had to be gracious or, or show interest. Um, but the treating system, men had more power because they oftentimes had more money. They were the ones who had to initiate the ask. And then because they were spending their money, um, you know, and they were usually able to, you know, make decisions regarding, you know, what the date involved. Um, and then, of course, women, because they were kind of... Um, the subordinate in in those interactions you know they they had a lot less power about you know um uh you know how to act or how gracious or not gracious you know that they they needed to be on this date that they weren't paying for um and so it's worth noting that this new system dating um, was rapidly accepted, particularly by the middle uh, class, as early as the first half of the 20th century. And, you know, and it remained very popular until around 1965. Um, and, and, and that's when I think, you know, thinking about the sexual revolution um, and, you know, some of what we've discussed in our chapter related to sexuality, um, you know, uh, the kind of expectations around even you know going on a date um and, and as a way of showing interest or a way of initiating kind of sexual uh, you know the possibility of sexual intimacy um it, it became less necessary um, as we started to see like, you know, with the sexual revolution, the beginning groundworks of, of what then escalated in the next 20, 30 years, which was, of course, you know, the rise of hookup culture. Um, so all of this, of course, as we're just going through this historical timeline, you know, what I most want you to really, you know, you know, just just start thinking about is how all of this is socially constructed, that what's acceptable, you know, uh, 50 today, you know, was was not acceptable 50 years ago. And what was acceptable then wasn't necessarily acceptable, you know, 50 years before that, right, that there that 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 none of this is necessarily stable or 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 uh, inherent or or uh, natural, right? All of it's socially constructed and therefore in flux. So what else is unique about this time period? Well, and, uh, you know, as, as you are now uh, women no longer in kind of the powerful position and you're having to, uh, you know, wait to be asked on these dates and to be treated, what we see is the beginning of the pressure to be sexy. Um, in fact, that it, the new definition of the word of that word um, appears in 1923. Before that, the word sexy really just kind of meant associated with sex. Um, like it was just kind of a, a adjective form of, of sex. But, you know, now or, or the, you know, when we think about what sexy means now, you know, that definition um, is comes out of the 1920s. And so along with that pressure to be sexy and that the, the pressure to have a man ask you on a date, treat you to a date, there start to be these aesthetic demands on women's bodies in the same way that we see now the rise of beauty culture um you know uh, the importance of diets because uh the the body the ideal body that comes out in the 1920s is unique um because for the first time instead of the ideal body being this uh fuller figured uh you know curvaceous uh heavier um, kind of body build now, you know, think about, you know, all the images that you've seen of flappers, you know, instead now there is this emphasis on being slender and thin, um, you know, almost to the point of androgynous. Um, and so in order to achieve that body, you know, women oftentimes had to diet um, and we also see the the rise of the makeup industries. Um, some of the in the the big companies that still exist today, they got their start 
um, you know, in during this time period, for instance, Maybelline, um, you know, uh, if, if you're like me, at some point, maybe in your life, you've owned um, some Maybelline mascara. Um, and uh, maybe you didn't know that that company is as old as it was. And even back then, apparently, mascara, uh, or what they called eyelash beautifier, um, uh, was a thing. Um, so, you know, what are the positives about this time period when sex, you know, really for the first time for both men and women starts to be, you know, released from these, uh, you know, Puritan uh, constraints and it starts to become fun? Well, the positive is, is, you know, it does represent increased freedom. Um, there are more gender egalitarian relationships um, as, as uh, young men and young women uh, start working together outside of the home. Um, that's more true for like working class, uh, working poor uh, men and women. Um, the development of cities allowed for queer communities to emerge. Um, uh, and so that was a kind of uh, important uh, kind of trend that comes out of this time, but they're negatives as well. Um, so the fact is, is there's still limited access to birth control um, and that meant the rise in premarital births. Um, and this is the time period where we start to see a real increase in single motherhood because unlike before, um, there is less community pressure to do the right thing. Um, you know, not as many shotgun, you know, weddings are taking place because uh, parents in the community no longer have that level of social control in these larger cities as they did in small towns. So you have more people having sex, uh, you know, outside of the constraints of marriage, but it, it was risky. Um, and, and even though, you know, and, and there was still stigma, uh, not necessarily in having the sex, but certainly if you wind up pregnant and unmarried, there was a stigma to that um, at that time period, um, because, you know, then there's the proof that you're having this uh, premarital sex. Oh, I'm still going backwards. So then we, you know, we'll, we'll skip over the late 20s and 30s. That's just sad depression era <laughs> America. Um, and no, no, no major shifts in regards to our definitions um, surrounding uh, love, marriage, and, and, and sex going on then. So we're now going to move forward into the 1940s and 1950s. And this is where we first start to see the replacement in a lot of couples of the patriarchal property marriage with this uh, newfangled uh, type of marriage called the breadwinner's housewife marriage. Um, and so there are a lot of contributing factors. So breadwinner's housewife marriage is, is this marriage that's built around the idea of separate spheres, um, that there's this public sphere that's inhabited by men and with a focus on production, they're making money and they're making the type of money that can support a family um, because during this time period, um, especially um, you know, post-World War II, uh, you have the push for what's called a family wage because the government was invested in the idea of women getting out of the job force and getting back in the home. And in order to make that happen, of course, they had to make it so that families could afford to live on one wage. And then um, in some countries, um, your book notes that uh, these policies were weaker in the US than most of Europe, there are also these breadwinner policies. And so these breadwinner policies, uh, you know, um, that were fought for by the unions, um, you know, these were policies that in some cases, you know, uh, paid, uh, compensated women for staying at home uh, and raising their children. Um, and, you know, some of these policies, you know, were more focused on pushing women out of the labor force and replacing them with men. Um, which is more the type of policies that were passed in America, more so than the policies where, you know, they were paying women to stay at home um, and, and, and raise children. But all of this led to the, the, you know, creation of separate spheres. So in the public sphere, you have men and they're focused on production. And in the private sphere, which is the sphere that's inhabited by women, the focus is on reproduction. And there is this whole uh, kind of ideology uh, referred to as the cult of domesticity, which really 
kind of elevated this idea of, of women being, uh, you know, super invested in the private sphere, right? In the beautification of their homes and making, you know, elaborate meals for their husband, you know, prioritizing, you know, uh, this, this idea of, you know, um, of, of taking care of him, of, of taking care of all of his needs uh, in the private sphere, of, of focusing on children. And, and, and at this point, of course, now very few people are living on farms. So families have, have, have gotten smaller um, uh, comparative to, you know, before, although they're pretty big families um, compared to, you know, the, the, the 10, 20 years that preceded this, um, because people weren't having a lot of children during the Great Depression. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that focus on raising your children and, and, and spending more time and, and that to be, you know, a good mother is to, to really be invested in your children. All of this comes out of this time period. What also contributes to, you know, this time period, as, as I discussed, is, you know, the fact that it is the baby boom. But then also after World War II, we have this push for suburbanization as opposed to urbanization. So baby boom is just, you know, this is the time period that happens, uh, you know, at the end of World War II and the decade or so that follows it. And you have have the children that are born during those years, there are much more of them than, like I said, the decade or two that preceded it. And then there are also more children born during this time period than the decade um, that come after. So people are having these large families because, um, first of all, it's seen as being their patriotic duty. Um, Children are healthier, so there's there's a decrease in infant mortality. Um, the SALT and polio vaccine um, uh, are 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 discovered and and are disseminated during this time period. So you have healthier children, um, and and then of course uh, for America at least after World War II, you know we kind of are are in this kind of financial uh you know boom this this golden period so people are like it's a great time to have as many kids as we can afford and with you know the government pushing family wage and breadwinner policies people are like hey we can afford to have a lot of children and so then what are you going to do with all these children well raising them in cramped apartments in the city is now no longer appealing so we have the development of the suburbs and so these are the areas that were before rural but now they are building homes homes, um, single family homes, as opposed to, you know, apartment buildings that have multiple families living in them. You have these single family homes and they are, um, you know, they're being built outside of the city. And the federal government plays a huge role here because, you know, they offer long-term mortgage, uh, long-term mortgages at low rates to qualified buyers, particularly for veterans, um, you know, the Veterans Administration, the VA, they offer even lower rates for XGIs. Um, and then this is also where we start to see the, you know, a big uh, push for highway construction that, you know, connected the suburbs to the city because for the most part, Part, the husbands who are going off to their public sphere to work their jobs where they get paid a wage labor, those jobs are in the city, but their wives are staying at home. Um, and to give you an idea, you know, is, 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 and, and just imagine, you know, at this time period, if you, you have never, you know, only have lived in, in apartments, right, you now have this home, um, you know, in these large tracks with all these other homes that look like yours, and you're able to pick your floor plan and your furnishings, and you decorate it. And this is partly what the cult of domesticity was about. It was about, you know, this idea that, you know, that this is where women should focus all their energy and efforts. Now, it is just worth noting that the suburbs weren't open to all. Um, you know, first of all, there were restricted covenants um, that in some cases expressly prohibited um, selling these homes to uh, people of color. Um, 
oftentimes African Americans, but uh, there were um, restrictive covenants that also sometimes limited the sale of homes to Latinos and Asian Americans as well. Um, and then even if there weren't restrictive covenants, there were oftentimes, uh, you know, real estate practices like racial steering, um, where you basically would steer people, uh, you know, steer minorities to minority neighborhoods, um, as opposed to steering them to, you know, any home that they can afford. But instead, you would steer them towards homes that were in, you know, in the side of town, which was uh, dominated by by minorities. Um, and then there were bank practices like redlining, which made it hard, um, you know, or impossible to get a good loan in an area that the the bank designated as um, unsavory to lend to, and they would denote those places on a map by using red marker. That's why we call it redlining. Unsurprisingly, a lot of those places, um, uh, you know, were places that had a high concentration of racial minorities. And so you didn't find a lot of racial minorities um, in places like Levittown, which, you know, was the brainchild of William Levitt. It was one of our first big uh, suburban communities um, and give you a video if you want to kind of get a better sense of what those early suburbs look like. So, you know, you have your women, you're, they're staying at home, um, and, and the men are going off to work and they're kind of focused on their lives in the suburbs. And, you know, what's really interesting, of course, is all of this is happening after women had just been in the labor market in greater numbers than they had ever been before. Because, of course, women were... Uh, told it was their patriotic duty to participate in the labor force during wartime, and they were actively recruited. I mean, that is where the Rosie the Riveter, you know, that that imagery that we all represent, you know, that we all, uh, that we all, um, I said represent, and that is not the word that I wanted to use, but I'm blanking on the word I want to recognize. There we go. That we all recognize, you know, that was a recruitment poster that was wartime propaganda meant to encourage women to enter the labor force. But once the war was over and men came home, there was also then an active counter campaign to then push them back into the home, to push them back into the private sphere as opposed to the public sphere. Um, and, you know, and, and, and they did that by uh, discrimination in, in hiring and promotion practices. They did that by, you know, the breadwinner policies, um, you know, that would resulted in women either not making nearly as much as their male counterparts or just losing their jobs to men applicants altogether. So, you know, with limited opportunities in the public sphere, women were whether by choice or by force, they were pushed back into the private sphere. And so what we see during the 1950s is what your book describes as the concerted entrenchment of the nuclear family, of that uh, breadwinner, um, you know, homemaker, uh, traditional family model. Um, and, and, but that wasn't the only reason why the 50s were, are, are a standout in terms of, of being unusual. Um, and I, there is a great book about this by Stephanie Kuntz. It's called The Way We Never Were. Um, I've used it in, in past classes um, when I teach family. But, you know, we think about, you know, the 50s and the early 60s, you know, before the revolutions began, you know, think about like that, those old black and white TV shows. And people talk about this as being like the golden era. And, the, you know, they, they speak about the way it used to be. But what's truly, you know, and this just shows you how faulty human memory can be, is, you know, if you look at the history of marriage and the history of families in America, that model, first of all, was was not true for everyone, but even for the people that it was true for, you know, people who were white and largely middle class, it was for such a relatively short period of time. You're talking about about a decade and a half, um, you know, that 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 kind of idealized uh, breadwinner homemaker, um, you know, model was 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 really in place. But yet we call upon that model all the time. Um, we meaning society, not we meaning me or perhaps even you. But we call upon that model all the time, you know, to talk about how the family has changed so much since then. But the 50s really were a, a, a unique time period. And your book gives you several examples as to why. 
Um, so one way in which the 50s were unusually conservative, you know, let's look at how homosexuality was was treated during this time. Um, you know, not that at any time period in history in the America, there's been like this high level of acceptance and tolerance um, of, of homosexuality um, in same-sex relations, but there was some level of, a, of acceptance in the 1920s. And they note particularly with women where there was like this well-known concept of smashing, where it was considered, you know, perfectly acceptable for women to have like these crushes and these kind of intense um, intimate friendships um, with other women. Um, and although, you know, your book notes, it wasn't explicitly discussed, um, you know, to what extent were some of these uh, super intimate friendships, you know, also sexually intimate. Um, certainly there is correspondence and there is media that suggests that there was some awareness that, you know, for some of these friendships, sexual intimacy was a part of them. Um, and then, you know, uh, even like, like thinking about World War II, you know, um, during this time period, the first gay bars opened in 1940. The first advocacy organization was founded in 1951. Um, these were largely for men. Um, gay women at this time were just less visible. Um, and your book kind of links that to just how in general women were just still kind of desexualized. There was still that good girl, bad girl, Madonna whore dichotomy where really no one was thinking about women having sex for anything besides reproduction purposes. And so the idea that women could be having lesbian sex was just, you know, mind-blowing, boggling. No one thought about it, um, except for perhaps the women that were living those lives. Um, and, you know, your book makes a very interesting point about, you know, to what extent does World War II play during, you know, does it play um, in kind of promoting this kind of increased awareness um, around homosexuality? Um, and they talk about, you know, it has a lot to do with the fact that you have, um, lots of men and women expending prolonged periods of time away from each other, um, largely in the company of members of their same sex. Um, and in the case of men, soldiers, you know, in, in, in situations that are dangerous and threatening, um, you know, but to the extent that this probably encouraged people to kind of consider and act upon um, same-sex desire is just, it's, it's not beyond the realm of, of possibility. Um, it, 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 it makes in a lot of ways sense. Um, but then shortly thereafter, there was this crackdown on it because we start to see in the 1950s um, defining homosexual as a person as opposed to an act don't know why I put two, two S's in person. Uh, I promise I can spell, but I apparently can't type. Um, but, you know, before this, of course, you know, same-sex sexual activity, you know, there was awareness of that. And there were terms for some of those activities, but we didn't start to actually kind of um, conceptualize and identify people on the basis of those activities until 1950. And kind of the result of us doing that of, of identifying people, you know, you know, on the basis of, of, of their sexual activities means that it set, you know, it, it set society up to engage in this kind of conservative backlash, because now the backlash was against these, against people, um, not even against like an act itself. And so your book talks about, you know, laws were passed, individuals experienced discrimination in a variety of spheres, everything from, you know, their ability to rent apartments, to um, get and keep jobs, you know, their abilities to enjoy kind of public accommodations and settings like bars and restaurants and clubs, um, you know, McCarthyism, which of course we associate Joseph McCarthy with his um, obsession with communists, but there also was a real focus on uh, locating and outing and punishing people um, who were believed to be homosexual as well. And so, you know, your book notes that the politics of the 1950s were unique. Um, you, they were unusually family focused, they were conformist, they were pro censorship and gender policing. So what happens if you're young and single during this time period? What is that like? Well, you know, 
one thing that, you know, the shift that we see uh, in dating um, and marriage during this time period reflects the realities of after two world wars and a depression, there was a bit of a male shortage and particularly, you know, a, a shortage of eligible, um, you know, eligible, financially stable, uh, non-traumatized by war men. And so instead of this kind of the original kind of conception of dating where, you know, both men and women are, you know, dating multiple people, there isn't that expectation of commitment, dating starts to take the form of what's called going steady. Where as opposed to you dating multiple people, dating now seems as it serves as a kind of precursor to marriage. Um, it's kind of a pre-commitment commitment. Um, and for, you know, women in particular, um, that's because going steady was seen as social security, right? You lock your man down, you lock him down early so you don't end up in an old maid. Because with the shortage of men, of eligible suitors, there's a real possibility of that. And at this time period, and hell, to a certain extent, even in today's time period, there's still this stigma around being a woman who is not married. Um, now, we'll talk about maybe why would men, because if there's a male shortage, then that means that there is a woman surplus. So why are heterosexual men going along with going steady? Um, we'll talk about that in a second, because it's related to this next question. You know, how did adults respond? Um, do you believe it or not, adults were not supportive of their teenagers engaging in going steady. Um, you know, they felt like there was real uh, dangers to becoming emotionally um, so invested in, in someone, um, in one particular person. And that's because that emotional investment aligned with um, increased uh, physical and sexual investment in one person as well. And that perhaps shed some light on why men were agreeing to go steady because, you know, going out on dates with multiple people, you know, and especially in, in a society where the sexual double standard is, is alive and well, you know, most women are not going to go but so far sexually on, you know, with those non-committed dates. But now going steady, seeing as it was seen as being kind of a commitment, a pre-commitment to being married, it was its own form of monogamy. Um, women were engaging in premarital sex. Um, if not premarital sex, certainly they were engaging in, uh, you know, sexual activities, not including uh, vaginal uh, intercourse, um, you know, in much higher numbers than they were before this kind of dating model um, existed and, and became dominant. And so, you know, if you're a man, it's like, okay, well, I can go steady and I can have sex with this girl who for all intents and purposes, um, you know, because the idea is she's only having sex with you and it's committed and you're supposed to get married one day, you know, she's still seen as a good girl. So it is the, it is the thrill of having sexual intercourse with someone who is on the right side of that good girl, bad girl dichotomy. Um, and so, you know, people might think that that's pretty uh, interesting, maybe even ironic, that during this decade known for its conservatism, that, you know, um, premarital sexual experimentation increased in this decade. Another factor that kind of led to this increase in premarital sexual experimentation is the role of the automobile. Um, they're now a lot more available to a lot more of the population, including young people. And if you know you'd use this automobile to take your steady out on dates and then after the date you know in your automobile kind of served as a a room with wheels so a lot of sexual experimentation was happening in the back seats of automobiles all around the country um, during this supposedly uh conservative time period and so as women are, you know, locking down, you know, their boyfriends by going steady um, in, in hopes of, of landing a mate, um, you know, what we have during this time period is, as your book notes, you know, we see a dip in, in age of first marriage, and we do have people getting married earlier. Um, not necessarily 
it was not necessarily though that these marriages were happier or more stable. And so to discuss that, before we discuss that, let's talk about the role that separate spheres probably played here. Um, so Talcott Parsons, who is a sociologist, um, you know, and, and he was in the 1950s and he was big on functionalism. Um, you know, he argued that traditional gender roles play a, a functional role in U.S. society, that they help our society function smoothly. And he says that's because we split men and women into instrumental versus expressive roles. So men are instrumental. They're part of the public sphere. They're making money. They're making decisions in businesses. They're making decisions in our political arena. And women have expressive roles, meaning they are making, you know, people in their lives feel good. They're taking care of them. They're raising children. Um, you know, they're making, you know, private, you know, homes uh, livable and beautiful and comfortable for the men. And he was like, and by allowing, you know, men to focus on their instrumental roles and women to focus on their expressive roles, uh, you know, this is allows for smooth functioning in society because, you know, men aren't having to worry about doing the expressive things. Women don't have to worry about doing the instrumental things. And doesn't this sound just good for everyone? And so before I get into the clear cost associated with these traditional gender roles in these, in these traditional marriages, you know, are there some benefits? Certainly, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, amount of time spent, um, you know, we know that, and, and this is true even today, that the amount of time that, you know, women who are, are stay at home uh, you know, wives and mothers, um, that they oftentimes, the amount of time that they spend doing uh, work, paid or unpaid, um, it is not as, as, as many hours as women who are both working um, as well as in families where they're responsible for the bulk of the second and third shift. Um, and though, although these working mothers um, oftentimes in surveys indicate a higher amount of satisfaction, they also are more likely to indicate, you know, that they are, uh, you know, don't have enough time in the day. They aren't sure if they're doing either role well, if they're being the best worker, if they're being the best mother, if they're being the best wife. And there is this sense it's because that they are getting spread too thin. And, you know, for men, of course, the benefit of, of, of the instrumental role versus the expressive role is you have someone in your life that is dedicated solely to caretaking, um, to making sure that you're fed and that your home is clean and that you're that your children are well taken care of. Um, and, but of course, you know, um, and, and, and not having to concern yourself with these things, which allows you to focus most more, more, uh, you know, it allows you to focus solely on work. Um, but, you know, there are costs there for men as well. And so we're going to talk about the cost of traditional gender roles, the cost of separate spheres. Um, and so maybe unsurprisingly, um, a lot of these costs uh, initially seem to, to come from the women's point of view. And your book mentions uh, that The Feminine Mystique, which was published in 1963 by Betty Friedan, addressed this question about why, you know, women weren't happy, you know, why being in the private sphere, um, not working, you know, how it, it led to this feeling of like self uh, dissatisfaction. Um, and in her book, she calls it the problem that has no name. And it's not just that, you know, these spheres that are separate and, and, un, and unequal um, because one becomes devalued because it's not uh, income producing the way the other is, but, you know, this gender stratification um, existed in all elements of life, um, you know, that even though it was no longer the uh, the patriarchal property marriage, you know, women weren't allowed to necessarily, you know, rent their own apartments or, you know, be in certain occupations or, uh, you know, attend uh, certain colleges or attend college at all. Um, you know, they weren't allowed to uh, open their own banking account or have a credit card without their husband's permission. And so, you know, with this forced dependency and these limitations, your book notes that even though people were now marrying for love, 
the separate sphere ideology drained the life out of the friendships people had before marriage and they found themselves unhappy. Um, and so it's not just, you know, women, but because men were kind of, you know, forced into this position of being the sole provider, um, it, it, the separate spheres made it hard for men to do anything but work for money outside of the home. Their primary role was to be a good provider. And so obviously this put stress on men who weren't able to provide the pressures of being what's considered a big wheel, you know, where masculinity is measured by power, success, wealth, and status. You know, this had an impact on men's self-esteem um, and sense of self-worth if, worth if they weren't upholding that ideal. Um, they were encouraged to focus time and energy away from family. And, you know, we know from uh, qualitative uh, data interviews of men who were um, fathers during this time period that oftentimes one of their biggest regrets is, is, you know, the impact that this had on their family ties, particularly with their children. If you're told that the, you know, main way that you are being a good father is by making money and that that should be your sole focus, you know, just think about all that you miss out on, you know, what Parsons labels as being expressive, um, you know, those feelings, those relationships, um, you know, in a lot of ways, isn't that what gives our life meaning? So, you know, men, there was a cost to separate spheres for men as well. Um, you know, and of course the cost for women, you know, as, as a lot of that's what I've already noted, you know, in a society where more values on paid work, caring for children in the home is often devalued. And so, you know, women were not seen as being uh, equal contributors um, in their own homes, as well as in larger society. They weren't afforded the same level of respect um, that, that men received. Once again, that would be both in their own homes as well as in larger society. And, and of course, you know, this is what's called a prescriptive ideal rather than descriptive, meaning, you know, this was during the time period, this was the image that was held up that women should be. Um, but, you know, and no, there are always women who are, are unable uh, to hold up that image, um, you know, to uphold that image, even if they wanted to. And so it's worth noting that working class um, immigrant women, women who are racial minorities, um, you know, much more of them were participating um, in that public sphere. But what's interesting is they were participating in the public sphere, they were working, but then there was still this expectation that they should be doing this expressive role in their families as well. So, you know, you know, for these women, they were our first wave of women that were experiencing this kind of second shift, um, you know, this sense that the work is never done because they're doing both this paid labor and this unpaid labor, um, that the fact that they were working did not mean that their husbands and their children had any uh, less expectations of them uh, in the home sphere. Um, and, and, and these women, and this is oftentimes um, a, a critique of the second wave of feminism, um, which most people kind of uh, designate as being jump-started by Betty Friedan's uh, The Feminine Mystique, uh, you know, she was not interested in, in the lives of these uh, working class, racial minority women, women who, uh, you know, their problems had, had names, right? They, they, they did not have the problem with no name. Um, you know, they, they had problems like, you know, having to work uh, in order to uh, afford to live, afford to raise their families. But, you know, all of this, um, you know, unhappy men, unhappy women, we can see it in some of the behaviors that start to um, become more dominant during this time period. Your book talks about the rise of premature babies, teen pregnancies, alcoholism and, 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 and uh, among men and women, pill popping, particularly among the uh, bored housewives, 
um, the creation of, of the, the Playboy uh, image, um, because it's during this time period in 1953 um, that you have the creation of the Playboy magazine, and it was meant to push back on this idea that, you know, men who don't marry, there's, that there's inherently something wrong or unnatural with them. Um, it was a pushback against this expectation that men should have these instrumental roles, that they should be breadwinners, um, you know, and instead kind of said, you know, no, you know, for men that felt constrained and, 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 by by that by that choice, you know, uh, Hugh Hefner was presenting this alternative lifestyle. I've already discussed Betty for Dan and the problem that has no name. Um, but maybe the best uh, kind of piece of evidence that despite what we might like to tell ourselves about this time period, clearly there was some unhappiness is this is when we first kind of see the first kind of spike in, um, you know, divorces, uh, you know, you can start to see the divorces starting to, to climb um, already in the early 1960s coming out of the 1950s. Um, and then, of course, you know, once no fault divorce laws were passed, um, where basically you could divorce without needing a reason, you know, you, you see that, that, it, that, that dramatic spike. But that is happening because these were people that were married during the 50s um, and they were uh, they were unhappy. Um, and the government kind of responded to that spike as your your textbook discussed. Um, you know, they responded, uh, you know, to displaced homemakers um, by doing things like requiring alimony and making divorce legally difficult. Um, but this did not uh, stymie uh, the rather high rate of people seeking divorce um, coming out of the 1950s. You know, other kind of um, uh, signs that, you know, the 1950s were not the golden age that, 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 TV uh, Nick at Night might lead you to believe is the fact that, you know, even with that push for the breadwinner housewife marriage model, more women were, were working uh, more than ever before, you know, despite um, the breadwinner policies that tried to push women out of the labor force. Um, some women pushed back. They, they refused to go back to being solely in the private sphere, even if it wasn't financially necessary. Some women just chose to work. Um, Obviously, there are issues regarding race during the 1950s. Um, the family wage was elusive for most men of color. A lot of that related to relating to uh, lack of opportunities in uh, the education as well as job um, uh, spheres, um, discrimination um, in the labor market. Uh, as noted by the textbook, despite their service, the GI Bill um, and 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 and, and the VA housing loans, they largely either excluded or limited the benefits to um, African American veterans, uh, in particular. Um, and so those families, um, you know, racial minority families, but as well as just some working class, working poor white, um, particularly white immigrant families, they needed two incomes even back then. Um, and so the econ and, and then just, you know, like I said, post World War II, America is during an economic boom. We have a booming economy. So we have plenty of available jobs and we need people to work them. So, you know, the economy needed workers. Um, even though at some, you know, at the same time they need workers and therefore that did lead to them um, turning to women to work those jobs. Um, at the same time, policies were put in place to try to discourage or limit women's workplace participation. In particular, you know, your book talks about marriage bans, how some occupations just flat out banned married women from holding those jobs. Um, and then for um, other, uh, other types of, of jobs, instead of marriage bans, they would do, uh, they would, they would pass laws that we would consider to be, or we would call protective legislation. Um, and so protective legislation is a form of benevolent sexism. Um, it, they were supposedly laws put into place to protect women um, from dangerous jobs, from doing light, night work, from you know working long hours. Um, 
But in a lot of ways, you know, these jobs that were supposedly designed to protect women, what they often, you know, the larger goal was really to restrict um, and limit their workplace participation. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 made these types of policies, protective legislation, marriage bans, it made, it, it made them illegal. Um, and, you know, there is this story behind the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you know, and it, that it, it was really meant to originally kind of focus on, on solely on race and ethnicity. Um, and there's this story that uh, Senator added sex um, to the to the to the to the legislation um, in hopes that it would kill it. Um, you know that people would there that there is no way that they would agree that women have um, you know this legal constitutional right to not be discriminated against. Um, but it passed. Um, and, and, and now, of course, there is some debate, you know, if whether or not that senator's actions are, are, are being wrongly interpreted. And if you're interested in that, in that backstory, and the debate around that backstory, um, you know, I give you uh, two articles that kind of present both, both sides of the story. Um, but the thing about the Civil Rights Act, and this is true really almost of any federal legislation that's passed, is that enforcement of the law was not automatic. So, you know, women have not made, it, it, it was not easy automatic acceptance into these occupations. Um, it's not like women immediately became free from workplace discrimination. But certainly, you know, the passage of that law, along with, of course, you know, all of the kind of movements that were taking place in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, civil rights movement, and, and then, you know, women's movement, and then the sexual revolution happened, all of these things, of course, are going to, uh, you know, impact um, that that popular conception around love and marriage, right? So we're back to, you know, what does it look like today? You know, what type of shift has occurred? And so, you know, if we think about the modern marriage, you know, despite there being concern about the decline of marriage, um, and, and, and there has been a decline, um, you know, there are more single people um, than, than ever before. And of that group, there is a, a growing percentage of people who are never married. Um, but despite that fact, um, most people in America still get married and marriage is still remains one of the most important aspects of an individual's life um, from kind of this symbolic socio-psychological perspective. Um, however, and, and, and it's still an important part of, of a person's identity, right? Their identity as a husband, as a wife, as a spouse, um, you know, people who are married still list that as being a, a, a you know, a, a, that identity is having real uh, personal as well as social significance. Um, but why people pursue marriage today, those reasons have become a lot more individualistic. They've become more self-centered, um, less practical, um, less, you know, family focused. So it's not like you're marrying someone because your parents want you to. Uh, in most cases, it's not like you're marrying someone because you financially have to. Nowadays, a lot of people say things like they're marrying, you know, someone because they love them or, you know, it's just they want to be married, personal goal fulfillment. They see it as an integral part of their happiness. Um, and at the same time, there are more life choices available for individuals today um, if they choose to not marry. Um, but what do those marriages look like? Well, you know, as we've transitioned from an industrial economy to a post-industrial economy, and your textbook describes this as a service and information economy, you know, most of us aren't, aren't working with our hands and in factories anymore. We're working either in the service industry or we're working as information workers, um, you know, which is a broad category of, of work. Um, but, you know, especially for the information workers, uh, you know, those types of jobs oftentimes require investment uh, in education, higher education. And so this has led to the transition to what's called the idealist 
idealized partnership marriage. Or another way to think about this, to use a term that, that's come up before in this class, is, you know, this is our egalitarian love, right? It's the love between two equals, and it's the expectation that in this, this, this marriage, you're going to share. You're going to share the responsibility for paid labor. You're going to share the responsibility for housework. You're going to share the responsibility for childcare. Now, to what extent that is this true, um, you know, we'll talk about this more um, in upcoming chapters, but, you know, you can kind of see that, you know, while women are participating more in paid work than their predecessors, um, in, and men are participating more in childcare um, and housework than their predecessors, uh, there is still this large gender gap in terms of uh, who is doing what in marriages. So, you know, the ideal is this, this, this partnership, um, this, this, this partnership between equals, but what happens in reality um, is not that, that straightforward. And this is the case, even though the marriage contract itself, your textbook notes, has become more gender neutral. Um, and so, you know, what does that mean, that the marriage contract itself has become more gender neutral? Um, that means that for the most part, um, marriage provides the same rights and responsibilities to men and women. Um, you know, both men and women are now responsible for paying alimony um, if they get a divorce, uh, you know, to whichever spouse spent time outside of the workforce to take care of family. A male widower can now collect his wife's social security check instead of his own. Um, before they noted in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, only wives could do that. So if you were a man and your wife died um, and she happened to be working, you would not have been eligible to collect her social security. The government just kept that. Um, uh, and now, of course, you know, men do have that right. Um, Men no longer have special rights to manage the family money, right? It's now considered to be joint partnership. Um, and, 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 and even though your textbook says that, you know, nearly all states now confer equal standing to both spouses and issues of child custody, that one is still dicey. That's, that's probably one of the areas where women still do, you know, benefit from some very traditional gendered notions about mothering and, 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 and just, uh, you know, maternal instinct, um, while men and women are likely to get joint custody, um, especially if um, uh, male and, and female are, you know, uh, parents are divorcing and they're seeking sole or primary custody. Uh, in a lot of cases, um, oftentimes women still have that, the edge um, in, in most of those family court proceedings. And so what this means is individual couples now have a lot of freedom comparative to the past and how they organize their lives, whether or not they want to be family focused or work focused dual earners, whether or not, you know, one person is going to stay at home and the other person is going to work and that person that's working could be male or female, you know, obviously uh, with Oberfell Hodges, you know, we have the constitutionality um, and the protection of gay marriage in all states. Um, there's the increased role of grandparents um, and, and, you know, people turning to grandparents to provide a child care services. Um, and this is kind of a, a, a callback to centuries ago where the focus was less uh, on the nuclear family and more on the extended family and reliance on extended family and kin um, to, to help provide care work. Um, you know, there is, uh, there are people that live together apart, you know, so you marry, but you don't necessarily share the same household or you don't share the same primary household. I, we've already talked about the fact we have more people just remaining single, the, the rise of the never marrieds. We still have a high rate of single parenthood, including single parenthood by choice, right? So it's not just that, you know, someone uh, knocked you up or, you know, and then, you know, refused a shotgun wedding or, you know, they left you, but it's the fact that there are uh, increasing numbers of people who are choosing to become parents on their own. And then, of course, there is the fact that, you know, although divorce rates have not 
uh, con in continued to increase, um, they have stagnated at a fairly high level. Um, and then, of course, the fact that oftentimes when people get divorced, they oftentimes remarry. Um, so we have the creation of, you know, what your book refers to as the marriage go round. And the fact that these remarriages oftentimes introduce uh, different family relations. Um, so we have the rise of blended families, which is what I think I was going to write for that final bullet that I did not finish my thought. So, you know, the kind of ending quote, uh, marriage is less necessary than it was in the past. And the primary reason to marry in Western culture is for love, which makes it both more voluntary and less stable. Um, and so the institution of marriage, you know, hopefully this chapter made it clear it's changed over time and it's likely to continue to do so over our lifetimes. So, you know, despite, uh, you know, people's tendency to look back at past time periods with nostalgia, the fact of the matter is, is, you know, these institutions um, have continuously changed and they will continue to change.